I'm Joe Forish, and this is You Say Data, I Say Data podcast. We talk about data, analytics, and its impact on business and society. We are the podcast for the Analytics Impact Network. Please visit us at analyticsimpactnetwork.org. Have you ever wondered why there is no everlasting remedy for potholes? How can you make a profit by investing in real estate? Finally, what can data do to change and shift your perspectives? My guest today is Dr. Gordon Chu. Dr. Gordon is an author, innovator, and investor. He completed Wharton's Advanced Management Program and Harvard's Business Analytics Program during the latter part of 2022 and co-founded his startup, Finegra, in February of 2023. Gordon is pleased to share that Finegra won the 2023 Global Tough Technology Prize in the Harvard Business School Alumni New Venture Competition. Finegra will initially commercialize Dr. Chu's discovery of a reactive graphene as a graphalt and asphalt additive that provides the durability, bonding, and oil retention of conventional asphalt. The new asphalt composite is proven to be an effective material for making enduring pothole repairs. Hi, Gordon. Welcome to the show. Joe, it's uh, finally we get to uh, we get to do this, right? Yeah, we've been planning this for quite some time. So it's great to see you and uh, great to chat with you this morning. Likewise, likewise. Yeah, so we we have a lot that we want to talk about because over the past few months, we've talked about a lot of things. But Mm. I think one thing that's really prevalent in a lot of people's minds uh, these days is EVs and how they're impacting the infrastructure of the country of the world. So I was curious to hear your viewpoint on that. Well, that right, hits right to the ju- you know jugular, right? You know, it's <laughs> like it's like I it really didn't wasn't my problem. It's like I I have two children, but if you asked me, it's like when we do the interview, Joe matters because if you asked me a question before I was going to have children, my answer was I wasn't planning on having children. So, what what do you think children will be like? What do you think of children in the future? And I said that's not my problem. Right. I mean, I'll answer you because I'll answer anything. <laughs> That's how I am. Right. But I'll, I, I, my, I just didn't have any relevancy to me to me. So like potholes and EVs, like these two topics um, really have a lot to do with each other when you look at data and data. Right. So so you say like EVs are are at least 130 percent heavier than your average vehicle. Uh, right? Yeah. Think about that. Right. Right. That. Yeah. Uh, the battery, it's just like, there's nothing like lithium. If you've ever dealt with a lithium battery, I mean, it's just heavy, right? It's very dense and other things, you know, come along with it. Like you see the Boeing reports and things catch on fire, but forget about the fire, just focus on the weight. Right. And you say, and also, you know, what's nice about an EV is that the acceleration is like, you tap it and it goes, it's like putting yeah. a lot of fire. You, you, you drive an EV. I have. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. You know, like the amount of, it's like really quiet Yeah. and it's like, it has a lot of power. A yeah. Lot the torque is incredible. Yeah, exactly. So, so you imagine the torque on your tires, right? Yeah. So your tires are going to wear out about 20 to 30% faster. But if you're buying an EV, you don't care so much about that. Now, how about what it does on the roads, right? You've got a substance like the favorite picture I have is, you know, the cyber truck. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and, and so not to name any names, right. Just cyber truck. Right. So you have like these advanced vehicles. Looks like you're from the Terminator and it's really cool. And you're driving down the highway and this marketing piece just has like the ground below it as the same material that we use currently. And we've been using since the 70s and 50s. It's just like plain old vanilla asphalt. So it's just going to break down with more torque, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And more weight, right? Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, it's like, let me give you some examples of, um, of the potholes yeah, that please. are around, right? So you look at areas where there's a lot of traffic, you get an increased amount of, tra- of potholes. Like if you go to a parking lot, right? The place where nobody parks, there's no potholes, right? 
In fact, the place that nobody parks and nobody plows, there's no potholes. It's like really good, right? But at the <laughs> moment you have like a lot of traffic, right? And, and let me just point to you, like EVs, you take a step back is w- what is your reason you even know this stuff about EVs? Like you, you drive an EV, I don't, right? I don't drive an electric vehicle. So I have not really considered much about it because it wasn't my problem. Just like kids were not my problem until you have them. So because I don't have an EV, you'd think like, why do you know so much about this stuff? Because I have a, I have shopping centers. And these shopping centers contain supermarkets on them. Mm-hmm. And these supermarkets don't have any EVs, but they have like these massive trucks that go there every day to deliver something called groceries. Right. And I thought, you know, when you're buying real estate, you know, wh- why do you buy real estate? Well, I buy re- bought real estate because I had kids and I didn't know if I was getting smart ones or dumb ones. Like, how, how do you know? Right. And then by the time you get to know that you got smart ones, Everybody thinks they got a smart one when they're like three years old and they're able to talk and walk and, and maybe do some other things, right? But then when they get to 15, maybe it's not so magical anymore. And by the time they get to their 20s, right? I know, like talking about data, because you and I come from a place called Harvard Business School's you know, analytics program, right? So they, they went and did this program that focuses purely on data. And looking at what that could do. And, you know, one of the business cases showed that if you go to a dentist, they could actually not see your teeth really well because it's their interpretation of the x-ray. You actually don't get to work with them to compare. So then they showed that this AI model could tell that they were flawed, these dentists. And then if you look into the data, because like, why do I care about this? I'm not a dentist, right? So you, you then start thinking, about, oh, but I get cavities and my kids could get cavities and other things could happen. And you start thinking about, wait a minute, is there a certain time? Like I asked a presenter this, who did all the research and raised the capital to do this. Is like, yeah. is there a time during the day that I should go to the dentist? And it turns out to be morning more than afternoons. Really? Like, yeah, there's not an exact time, but Dentists are people, right? They're human and they make mistakes. And you say, really? So then now every time I book a, a dentist now, it's affected me. So that's just a, a side anecdote, right? To the plaza. So I buy this piece of property. Now it's not cheap when you buy commercial. Like it's not a few hundred thousand dollars. You're borrowing millions of dollars to buy this thing that you base it off of a piece of paper that says, here is your cap rate. And just to explain what a cap rate is, it's based on whatever your, like the total amount, what it's going to yield you. And not so long ago, you couldn't get anything at the bank. You put your money in the bank, you get nothing out, right? And right, then, no yield, and then, right? Right, no yield, right? And it's been like that for a long, long time. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, all right, in case I get dumb ones, I want to be able to pass something on to them. Now, you know, I mean, people are going to look me up and they'll see that. I'm a scientist. So I think, right? I think for a living and how I think determines exactly what food arrives on my table. If I think small, I get small types of food. If I think big, sometimes it doesn't work, right? Thinking big is great. Think big or go home. Well, most of the time you're just going home. (laughs) So it's like you try to catch, you know, who doesn't know if you catch an elephant, you're going to eat, you're going to eat more meat than if you were to catch chickens. The problem is, have you ever tried eating an elephant? Like never, in, right? I me neither. I have never eaten an <laughs> elephant or a woolly mammoth, right? For that, you know, it's like, <laughs> right? Could you? But you could you imagine if we were back in the you know caveman days, and you and yeah. I would go to this place called Harvard. Back then, they had like a different name for it, I'm sure. And it was all about the rah rah attitude, and you'd come up with these songs to know, like you and I would chant to ourselves. Because we in the cave with those writings. And why, why do we have the writings? Is because we know that the both of us, one of us might not make it or both of us not make it, but we have to psych ourselves out. So that I'm just painting some images in, your, in the listeners' heads, all right, about this. So that's how the chance came. But you, you want to say, like, imagine you and I also knew Thomas Edison. We could go in this time machine and say, hey, Thomas, you know, how did Cleopatra sing? Like, you know, I'm sure she did well because she was Cleopatra. What was mm-hmm. her voice like? And he said, well, 
Unfortunately, the phonograph was only invented in the 1870s. I think it was 1877. I'm just, you know, I'm not looking anything up. But, around, you know, it's just like recall around that time period. But, you know, by the time he cranks it and gets it going to record, you don't get to record the people in the 1870s. Just, you know, a data point there. I'm just throwing out data, right? But Cleopatra was nowhere near 1870. So right. the point of the, of the discussion is that you might get to collect data or you might not get any data or you might be presented data that has no relevancy. But depending on what you think about something may then determine this. So I was thinking I might get dumb kids, but I'm still, I'd like, they don't call me Dr. Chu, my kids. My daughters don't call me Gordon. They don't even call me Gordon, right? My parents call me Gordon. So people who are really close to me call me Gordon, right? My, my wife, you know, she, she doesn't always call me Gordon. Like there's some nice names, too much information, right? But I, <laughs> I'll tell you what my, my kids call me. They call me dad, you know? Yeah. And so it's really close and intimate, which also is code for like, you're responsible for bringing them as, into this world, right? If you look at it that way. So, so I started looking at my senses became heightened and I, and I said, I got to do something for them that has nothing to do with science because they don't know any science. In fact, for the next 18 years from the time they're born, they don't know enough science to do anything. Like I, you don't go to a one-year-old and say, what is your return on investment? <laughs> You can't yeah, it's a little go, tricky. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You can't even go to an 18-year-old and do that. So you're basically digging a hole when you have children, like a deep hole, and you have no idea how wide it will be and how deep it will be as far as financially or even whether or not it produces anything. You're just going to dig a hole like you're going for the gold rush, and you might not find any gold underneath. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's just painting some more pictures. Right? So now this impetus to buy real estate and, you know, do you have any experience being a father? And I, you know, before I had my first one, I had none. And after I first one, I had no experience having two children. So now I don't have the same fears when I'm going out dating. Like people ask me, have you ever married anyone before? No, I have no experience, but I am going to be a great husband, right? You, 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 you say your marriage vows, you do those things, but fatherhood gives you a whole nother fear set. So if we're looking at data sets, it's a whole nother fear of the data is that what back to that dentist what are you telling me that they they get tired and when they got tired my teeth are at risk oh so they might look at a cavity and say you know i, I think we need to drill there and whenever they drill they drill a bigger and deeper hole so and then they put stuff in and then as it continues like if it fails you need to drill another bigger and deeper hole the next time you do a filling and eventually that then goes to a crown, and eventually the crown becomes a root canal. So that, that's how this whole process begins. So mm. It sounds very it, painful. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever had any cavities, right? You know, most people I have, have yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Have they turned into crowns yet? No. No, right? Okay, so just a thought, a food for thought. So have you ever bought any real estate? Well, the place where I live, but nothing on the commercial end, uh, like you've mentioned. Right. So the place you live produces income because you go to work. Okay. So people say like the place you live doesn't produce any income. Yes, it does. What are you doing? So you are actually producing income and some places produce a lot more income. It's just that no one can invest and own it, right? You own it and you produce your income. All right. So you start thinking about, does it matter where you live? Does it matter? And I promise you it'll come all back to this topic. All right. But let's keep going. I buy this yeah. piece of real estate, right? And you have to know how a scientist brain works, right? You buy this piece of real estate and the realtor says there's no difference when you look at a cap rate between like a Dunkin' Donuts, CVS, Rite Aid. I'm just giving out some names. Walmart. These are bigger. You know, yeah, they're all good people. tenants. Yeah, yeah they're, all, they're all national tenants, right? They're all national. But I just named one, Rite Aid. Rite Aid is not as healthy as a CVS if you look at the stock market. But- Oh, are they still paying your rent? Yeah, they're paying your rent. So you don't really, like it doesn't really impact you. But if you're buying Rite Aid stock, if you were to look at it, right, you'd say, wow, I don't know if I really want to own that. And then you look at CVS, these days it's not doing so well. So you say, oh, I don't want to really want to own that too. I'd rather own the Dunkin' Donuts or the Walmart. But it's only hindsight in 2020. But in real estate, all of that goes away. It's not, you're not buying the stock. You're just making sure you collect the rent. Mm -hmm. So now let's look at, 
what else is different between that and the grocery store and all that is that Dunkin' Donuts is not going to have an 18 wheeler come in. It just doesn't. Did no. they have that many donuts to deliver in the morning? <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. So, so but, but even, then, even if it were an 18 wheeler full of donuts, it would actually be probably light. Exactly. <laughs> compared to right. coffee, coffee would be a lot heavier because it's liquid, no? Ex- exactly. Right. So it all depends on. Actually, except that don't like, okay, then we add in the ice cream store, a non-national tenant, let's say an ice cream, unless it was like Baskin Robbins or something, right? But, but let's say an ice cream store, every summer, all those people will come on the property to get ice cream and then they drive. Imagine if those were all electric vehicles and they're revving and they're running and they're like heavier, right? Like, you know, as a landlord, when you collect rent, every time someone like does something to your property, it's like, oh. Oh, that hurts. You are like, like get off my property and just pay me my rent, right? I'm just really he- heightening the the experience, right, for mm-hmm. anyone. So you kind of see, and then and then of course you hope that the Fed keeps the interest rates going the way they were, right? Because if the interest rates like they are now offers you five percent for doing nothing. And then real estate gives you 8% or 7%. If you buy the CVS, by the way, or the Dunkin' Donuts, you might only get 4% on the triple net property, 4%. So now you're like upside down. I like to use upside down because it's like simple. Upside down, what does it mean? You know, you're st- can you stand on your head, right? Most people don't understand what that means. So I'm going to ask someone to say, do you know what it's like to sit on yourself? You're sitting on yourself means like you're when you slouch, when you sit in a chair, you're slouching and you're actually putting the weight of your body on your anatomy so that the structure starts to deform. And that's what I call sitting on yourself because you've never known how to sit. Like, do you know how to sit? You watch someone at a Starbucks get in and out of their chair. You don't really know if that's the correct or do you cross your legs, right? You cross your legs. Some things that you do all the time or do you sleep on a bed that sags, right? Those types of things cause deformities. So back to the electric vehicles, right? So we have that increased deformity and we got climate change, climate change, climate turbulence. Let's even call it climate turbulence is the snow, the hot weather, all the dryness, the cracking, the, the point is asphalt is not a very strong material. And then when it breaks down, it breaks down. The problem is we don't know the rate it breaks down. And when we repair asphalt back to the dentist that we had that mm-hmm. Harvard case is that they don't even drill the hole wider and deeper to do the filling. They just don't. So, and unlike dentistry where we went through gold and then we went through amalgam, right? We had the mercury fillings and, and then we went composite. There's no research being done on, oh, you know, let me put a nicer filling in there. There's just like asphalt filling. And then there's like worse than that, which is cold patch filling. And within a year, if you do the wrong type of filling, it could break down. All right. So back to that ownership of, you know, because we have a lot of data sets coming in here. If you buy the wrong property, you could be dealing with potholes. And that's what happened to me is that the truck, the 18-wheeler, came in, and it's and, and at the down-sloping point was where three months, within three months after buying the property, because anytime you want to buy a property, you want to negotiate, you know, to have the, you know, everything taken care of. That's why when you sell a property, people say, oh, I want to fix this and this other thing, unless you say as is, and they still want to close, right? So I got up this property, and it came like they had to fix everything. Everything was fixed. And within three months, Potholes start showing up at the downslope. Now it doesn't downslope and then arrive at the dock. It downslopes and then it flattens and upslopes and then it arrives at the dock. So mm-hmm. this eighteen wheeler that came in and bang, 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 and then you've got these potholes that show up. So of course I'm like, I'm frustrated. I feel ter- perturbed, right? I'm really perturbed. This is a big SAT word for the kids that listen. To the <laughs> well, um, <laughs> but you know, it's like it's like like I'm just like there's fear that sits in. And my heart says, like, just, we need to sell this property, but you can't because now all the payments that you've made, all the legal fees, you lose a lot of money when you, when you like stop and go, you can't stop and go, go and stop when you're investing. All right. So you do these things and I've never bought a property before, just like I've never had children before, never became a husband before. So, you know, imagine if you told your, 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 the girlfriend you're dating, I've been a husband six times. That's why I'm going to be successful. 
right? I noticed you just took a sip of water. I want to make sure that I control that, right? Because you know we don't want to, yeah. So risk, right? Risk and reward. We know that you know, anytime there's risk, there could be a reward. That's what people say, especially when they're trying to sell you the risk. They're going to say risk reward. But actually, the data shows that more than 95% of people who invest in real estate over the long term will lose money. Yeah. Really? And that's yeah. across commercial, residential, everything else? Well, I don't else. know if you like start splicing all the details, right? Mm -hmm. But you will lose money. So, for example, in residential, if you wow. live there and your taxes go up, right? Your taxes keep going up. You don't calculate that. So you feel like you've actually made money. But if you included like making money as like net net, most people would lose money. Right? Oh, okay. So it's a, a, an issue people not really doing their accounting properly. Possibly. For the money they put into a property. Possibly, right? But it gets worse. I'm going to tell you a fish story that is nothing like you, the normal fish stories you hear where I catch fish every time was good. I'm going to tell you what happened with these potholes is that I went back and asked about these. And they said, you know, there's two people you can ask. You can ask the seller, seller's attorney, all in the same, right? Seller, attorney, seller. Or you can ask the people who fixed the potholes before. You hire the same people, you ask them. And you end up getting, or what I ended up getting was, these potholes will recur 18 to 21 of them every quarter, right? So let's just round to 20 as easy number times four mm -hmm. quarters in a year. That's 80 potholes. Yeah. And, and if, I, if I shared a data set with you is like, how many potholes does it take for you to sue me? <laughs> does it take 80? <laughs> does it take 79? Or it's like one, right? One pothole is enough for someone to sue you. If they fall into the pothole or they affect your car or, you know, something happens, right? So cities and towns are being sued all the time, but they've got a provision that says like, if someone didn't report the pothole ahead of time and they didn't fix it within a reasonable time, then you can sue them. But if it's like, if it's like, you know, that nobody reported it and you fell in the pothole first and you like damaged your car, you actually can't sue them. Right? Hmm. You can't claim any damages, right? And suing is just a process. It's just like, you really just want to claim for the damages, right? Move on. So what kind of damages are we talking about when it comes to, um, to these potholes to a car? It's about $600 and that's an average number. And it's highly dependent on what type of car you drive. If you drive a Tesla, low profile wheels, and you end up in a pothole, on a rainy day and it just wasn't like you were going faster because you had the vehicle and you thought the road was flat, flat, flat and you went inside this pothole and it ends up being deep, you could damage a lot of things, right? And remember the batteries there, there's a lot of stuff. So numbers out there, you can go on YouTube and see it. It's like $2,600 and up. Oof. Yeah. So, you know, so let's go back to the $600 though, is that the average American cannot afford the average American cannot afford a six hundred dollar bill for their car, and that what is that? How many Americans are we talking about? About sixty two percent, according to the uh, Automobile Association of America, right? So according to AAA. So you start looking at that's not my problem. I just like I I can like avoid these potholes when I'm driving. I don't have to buy a Tesla. But now if I own the piece of real estate, it's my problem, and I really want to like sell it cover it up and sell it and, and get to like sell it to someone else. So this is risk reward, right? Here you go. Right. Yeah. Yeah, now, yeah. Ex except the risk was so high now because I told you that the, you know, and listeners is that the cost of stopping and going in investments, right? Imagine if when you sell a stock, the commissions fee, if he was 50% of your, of your, um, of your holdings. Imagine if you had fifth, whatever you buy, it's 50%, right? Then nobody would sell, right? They would just wait. So in real estate, there's something that doesn't get calculated in the cap rate is the lawyer fees, the uh, title insurance. The title, mm -hmm. And also when you're buying these insurances, they're, you're buying like for the whole thing to be rebuilt, right? So there's a lot of extra fees in there that if you weren't to incorporate the fees and then if you borrowed any money, there is actually a something called 54321. So generally speaking, so five would be whatever you borrowed, you've got to pay a 5% penalty. So you borrow a million dollars, okay? 10% would be 100,000. So you, you have like a $50,000 penalty, you know, if you're, if you're looking at, you know, the, the 5%. And then you got the lawyer's fee. And remember, if, if you buy a, a million dollar property and you, you know, 
uh, by the way, this was not a million dollar property. So just to just to give you some idea of the calculation is that the law, the legal fees and other things. And remember, if a million dollar property were to give you an eight percent return, you would get eighty thousand dollars at the height of it. Okay, at the mm -hmm. peak. Anything else that goes wrong, you will get less. So if you were to just go and um, you know, I don't want this anymore. Now you have less, right? You basically lose money in your investment, right? So, so then what about if I fix them? That's the next strategy, right? What if I fix them? What does it cost? Well, they said that it recurs every quarter and only one pothole is enough for people to be upset, okay? And how many potholes does it take for your tenants to leave? Well, according to data sets, we know that causation and correlation, right? They're not always, you know, you know, the, the data is not always the way you see it. So, for example, if I jumped up and down and the sun came up when I did that, <laughs> and then I took the test and I got 100, can I then next time, as long as I jump up and down three times, the sun is up, will I get 100 on the next test, right? And we know that what the data set that showed previously cannot correlate to that. So the problem of tenants leaving has nothing to do with potholes. but Maybe it does. Or maybe it can. It, it, can. it can. It can, right? Maybe they're and not they telling you that either. Right. They're not telling you that. Either. Right. They will never tell you. But I can tell you, and if we had a discussion about potholes and if you damage your car, you're probably not going to, not only do you want to sue, but you're probably not going to go there again. Like you're really angry at the place and the potholes are not going to email you or text you like you kind of, like how we were signing up for the call, Right. You texted me because I was signing up on the the other item and the, we were able to get this going, right? That's what texting and WhatsApp and emails are for, right? But the potholes do not tell you. So you don't really know. And so from a tenant's perspective, once a customer is gone, say you're, you're a target and your customer says, you know what? I can get the same things from Walmart and I don't have to deal with these potholes. They're gone. Right. right. They're gone. They're not coming back. So, so for a very long time. So with, when business is tough, it's complicated. And that's why I want to show that it's not that the correlation is, is, is not, it has to be a, you know, really high or the P value has to be really low. It's like anything that breathes on that $80,000. Remember, we're talking about a million dollar property, $80,000, anything that makes it less should irritate you. Because if you're owning a million dollar property, you probably work for a living. You know, work for a living, and you're hoping that the eighty thousand dollars is supplemental income for your nest egg. Now multiply that. By the way, just to give disclosure, I have twenty million dollars in properties. All right, so so my problem is a lot bigger than the million dollar problem. Okay, and I have more problems of this showing up, but this pothole thing started showing up, and it got me looking at what causes potholes. I started looking at the EV vehicles, and you're thinking like, all right. How many EV drivers will there be by 2030? And some estimates show that one out of every three, one out of every three drivers will have this powerful thing in their hands, right? It's like, think iPhone, right? They're, they're, you know, nobody thought that they would have this much power in the 70s, and then they have all this power to them, all right? So this power, but now I want to paint another picture is how do we transport vehicles that you like across the country, right? It doesn't just appear at the, at the ports and it just arrives in your town. Like what if you live in the middle of the United States? How do you get an EV electric vehicle? It's transported to you. They don't drive your car. They put it on a truck, right? And mm -hmm. this truck will actually have like, imagine like buying a car dealership, right? From the perspective of the guy who's telling you about real estate, right? You buy this car dealership as the landlord. You're not running this thing, right? And they're bringing this thing in because it's going EVs. And this thing brings in like, I don't know, let's say 10, normally 10 vehicles. I don't know the number, 10 vehicles. But now every vehicle is 150% heavier, 130% heavier than the other one. They're still bringing in 10 onto your property. What the hell, right? It's like, you're looking at this and say, how come I didn't listen to Joe Forish's podcast? I could have protected <laughs> myself, right? You know, like if, I, if only I knew, right? You heard it here, right? You heard it here that correlation and causation, forget about that. Throw it out the window. Is anything that eats into your 80K on that $1 million property, should you should like really heighten your senses, right? Yeah. It's and like the, the way that you've described it, given that there's potholes every quarter, 
and we're using $80,000 as an example, hmm. it sounds like it's a pretty expensive problem to have as a real estate owner. Oh, yeah. And you know, the banks, remember how we did that case on Lending Tree, right? You know, yeah. We did the Lending Tree case. Well, they were showing like there was this guy who was actually a, um, like Lending Tree's model is to lend to people who, who are more risky, right? Uh, but they make a better return and, and they're, they've got this algorithm that figures it out. So we went inside the data set and we, I saw, I literally saw a guy who works for a living in the jail centers, right? Looking after the inmates. But he mentions that he has $8 million stashed somewhere and he just needs 50 grand. All right. Wow. Now, is that an outlier that like, you know, you throw out of the data set, right? Because you say like, what is the chance of the guy having $8 million? But what is the chance? Why does he need 50,000 now? And will he pay us back? And on top of that, that data set, he was, he was actually over a year delinquent. Hmm. What mm. do you think, right? Sounds what funny. <laughs> okay, right, right. So, so like I just wanted to geolocate where these potholes were and it was on the downslope, right? Okay, the downslope so, yeah. going into the loading dock yeah. on your property. Mm -hmm. so, well, it downslopes, then it flattens, then it upslopes to the loading dock, right? So okay, and it's just downslope, one loading dock or is it multiple? It's one massive loading dock for the, okay. for the supermarket. There's other tenants, right, that don't mm -hmm. need that, but they have this loading dock, right? Okay, so now I'm looking at this and saying, like my scientist mind, like normally I charge for being a scientist, right? Remember I'm talking about real estate. I couldn't charge myself, right? So I worked for free. Make sure you add that into your accounting, right? Because like this other entity owes me all this money, right? Yeah. But because I'm also, it's also my right hand. It's like left hand, right hand. It's also your right hand. Do you want to cut off your right hand? You don't want to use your left hand to help your right hand, right? So it's like it taught me a lot of things about like parenting when I talk to my two kids is like, yeah, I know that you finished your, all your food, but your sister hasn't finished yet. So it's like, it counts against both of you. <laughs> so, and, then, and because like the other one will start talking the other one further delaying and it turns into a three hour meal, right? <laughs> so, right? so just, just like, you know, giving some, some flavor to those potholes. And so I'm now working for free. My scientist mind is, a, and to describe it is my heart wanted to move on, but my mind just said, you can't, you can't because if, because you're going to lose money in your investment and you don't want to keep doing that. Otherwise it's like, you know, every time your stock goes down, you sell it. Oh, well you sell at losses. Imagine if you did that all the time. Right. So, so, you know, you'd have nothing left. Your principles at risk. So you've got, you've got your mind says no, but then your other mind, right? Remember the scientist mind says, I could fix this. Oh, I can fix this. How do you fix this? Well, do you know anything about paving? No. Have you paved anything before? No. Right. So, so, but I've worked on this thing called graphene, right? And so okay. I put the graphene, which is by the way, a 23rd century material that's stronger than diamond, right? More conductive than copper. And, you know, this was part of my other venture. That's how come I had money to like invest and various things like that. All right. So I go in there and I fix these potholes and when you fix them, you actually don't know what you're doing, by the way, right? Because you've never fixed potholes before, right? You have no experience in business. And same thing you could apply to the real estate. You've never done bought any real estate like that before. In fact, the bank told you, like, why would we lend you money? Do you have any experience? And the answer was no, right? Now, I was able to convince them. I said, don't worry. By the time I'm successful, you would have wished you never asked me that question, right? <laughs> right? Okay. So you're, you're trying to convince them, but in your heart's heart, you know that you don't have experience. So I put it in there and you cross your fingers, right? You really cross mm -hmm. your fingers and hope it doesn't, it like, it just, it just works, right? And it worked. The potholes never came back ever. And it's been five wow. years. Wow. Wow. So yeah. you, you went and developed this, this material called mm -hmm. graphene. Right. And was it the first time you used it was at your, your commercial center where the shop, the supermarket is to fill the potholes and it's worked for five years? Yeah. So it's not the first time I've used graphene. I've used graphene for over 10 years oh. in different systems where people hired me. Like for example, a military would ask me to do something and then they want to heal their ships and it's metal uh, and you are able to do that. So I have a series of patents on that. Uh, all granted patents, like they dump $40 million, right, into the thing. And so you know that it can strengthen plastic. If you just Google my name, Dr. Gordon Chu and patents, you'll see like a bunch of these patents, right? So I have now 41 patents that are granted, right? Granted patents all over the world about how you can use 
various inventions, but a subset of that is a large subset is on graphene and what it can do. It can make a sponge, and then that sponge can selectively only, like a household sponge, now is transformed to absorb only oil and not water. Like what household sponge do you know that only absorbs oil and not water? You take the same household sponge and you add the graphene to it. You got to add a special kind of graphene called reactive graphene. And then you now, like almost like, imagine if you had a friend called Clark Kent and, and you know <laughs> he could be Superman, but, but what he does, and this is a new, new storyline for us, is he could give you his powers temporarily. Just transfer, and but then he has to become Clark Kent, so he goes to work, right? But he can transfer right. his powers to you, all right? Now that's a pretty amazing thing. Now, but he doesn't have to transfer powers to you. He can also be Superman. So graphene has this story to it. It won the Nobel Prize in 2010 in physics. Wow. Right, two two Russians, uh, you know, developed this. Right, Andrei Geim is one of the names, and the other one is Novoslav. And so you've got this thing, and how they discovered it was using Scotch tape. So you take scotch tape to, like, uh -huh. if you take a graphite pencil, right, which is yeah. a mechanical pencil, and you scribble yeah. on something, you put the scotch tape on there, and then you peel it off. Now you have the beginnings of graphene. What you need to do is you now have to take another piece of, of scotch tape, and then you stick it onto the other one that you peeled off, and you now press it together, and then you peel it off, okay? And now you have two sides that have something on them. Yeah. Getting closer to graphene. Do it again. And eventually, you end up having graphene on scotch tape that's stronger than diamond and copper and gets you the Nobel Prize. So that's, that's the experiment I just gave you. So that's all we have to do, right? Except the problem is you don't have a lot of graphene on the scotch tape. And also, while it's stronger than diamond, you have such a small amount of it that on, it's only stronger than diamond if you find the piece of graphene and you actually like put the pressure point right on that sheet on the scotch tape, right? At, right at that point, mm -hmm. anywhere else, right? You know, any, right. It'll yeah, break. It, yeah, it'll break, right? So it's like, it's like, it's amazing. And yet it's not right. And here's another thing for the fairy tale is that if the graphene sticks with graphene itself, it turns back to graphite and you know, pencils break because of graphite, right? So, so anyway, I'm not going to go into too much of that. I just want to highlight that just take it for what it's worth is I put the graphene into the potholes. And the potholes didn't come back for the first summer and then didn't come back for the next, uh, the, the fall and the winter and then the spring. And eventually it becomes five years. Wow. So if I knew this was going to, like, you know, because it's been all over the news now, is that the Harvard news is that we won. My team won the Harvard. Congratulations. Team new venture competition, right? So like, what does it mean to win tough tech, right? And the, the title says it all is that the most promising deep technology, right? So they, the judges looked at this and said, like, what is this? Right? Mm -hmm. You know, right? Because it's exciting, have, yeah. right? It's exciting. You have something like this. And, and I and I in on the deck, it says veteran graphene scientists, right? Because, because I'm a veteran, you know, veteran just means you've been there in a long time. And you do this fluke, right? If I knew that this was going to be a startup five years ago, I would have. So what you, the story I'm giving you is it went from like from zero to zero plus one, right? It's not hero yet, right? It's not hero because what I'm about to share with you is the heroic story that might happen. Okay. Sounds good. So you got, you went from five people that now know about it before it was just one and my wife and my kids, but then five people because that you build your team member, then it's 50 and then 500 and 5,000 people now know about this because of winning the Harvard thing. Right. And then now some undergraduates and masters in engineering classes want to bring the story in, right, right into Harvard. Right. So it's like really cool for the, you know, and I didn't even go to HBS, right. For the, um, for their MBA. But my partner did. From in 1978, he graduated. He's actually 75 years old, Ron Terraza. So, so it's like he said, "Well, we want we want the doctor to 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 present." So I'm presenting, and you know, you wouldn't expect to win because you know it's like there's like I was competing against cookies and other things, right? And so <laughs> right, because it's about the business model, right? But I I basically said to the judges, "This is what's going to kill you," and and back then. When I did the pitch before the announced on March 31st of 2023, I didn't have the example of Silicon Valley Bank like I have for you today. Right. Okay. So what happened with Silicon Valley Bank? They ran, there was a run on the business model, right? 
Okay. So imagine if the, it wasn't a run on the bank. It was a run on the bank's business model, right? Because whatever they were doing before taking, you know, these people who had a lot of money who were uninsured depositors, suddenly they want to move their money because we started this podcast with the Fed, right? Raising the rates to 5%, right? So unlike me, right? I'm bound to the real estate. They can move their money anytime, right? Okay. So I'm bound, all right? So what I want to highlight is uninsured versus insured. Insured, you could leave it at the bank, provide the bank matches the interest rate. Now, some people still move it to the government because the rates are higher. But if you're only dealing with like $10,000, you probably don't care about that 1%, right? You know, uh, uh, of a difference or 2%. You might, but you might not, right? So that's where your risk reward is if you're, if you're running a bank. But if you have lots of uninsured depositors, and by the way, this is just borrowing from Wharton. The number of uninsured depositors should always be like at high risk. It should be five to one, uninsured to insured. Well, Silicon Valley Bank was 30 to one, uninsured wow. to insured. That right? high? Yeah, that high, all right? So way over, right? This is, this is giving quotes back to Wharton, right? So now, now what I want to do is I want to highlight the pothole issue, right? We're tying it all together. We've got nine minutes yes. left, right? We're going to yes. tie it together, right? So don't we all live in cities and towns, right? We all do that, right? And I have heard from somebody who is in government, and they were sharing with me because after you win, you get to meet a lot of people, is that we're collecting taxes this year, and, we, and that is not, those taxes collected are not enough to pay for the potholes from five years ago. Cool. And this is state, federal, both? Well, I haven't reached the president, so, you know, you know so, right? and I don't want to have like a bunch of phone calls yet, but I, you know, I'm looking at you in the eye. I'm sharing with you if you, you know, I have my reputation on hand, but I've heard this from somebody who we put in power, we vote for, and they have told me, you know, that, the, and they're not so powerful. They're not, they're not the president of the United States. And I, sometimes you don't even know if they're that powerful, but they run places where people live, right? And you're going to work every day. And, you know, this is not a small town and it's larger than a small town, but it's not a country. All right. So I'm giving you somewhere in between. And they sure. told me that the taxes they collect cannot pay for the ta potholes from five years ago. And they know what I'm thinking, like, wait a minute, I don't live there, but I'm never going to move there. <laughs> right. I'm never going to move there. I'm not going to move there. Right. So you like, you really want to know, like, like, but how, like how, how many banks have a uninsured to insured deposit ratio that's beyond five to one. You want to really question. know, that, right. You really want to know. It's like how many cities and how many towns are collecting taxes from me that can't, are not paying for this year's potholes, this year's infrastructure costs. And just like, because it has nothing to do with me, I'm just going to pick the places that have a good ratio. So what happens if 200,000 people leave a city? You don't get to collect those 200K person's taxes anymore, right? right. They move to another state. Well, that's, by the way, happening all over the country for other reasons, by the way, right? And I just, I just sent you that article from Forbes, right? So you know that Forbes, Forbes wrote about how the electric vehicles, the weight, no one's talking about that. And then the other article was on climate conditions causing more potholes like you get potholes in hawaii by the way it's number two in the country like i'm pretty sure people know that hawaii doesn't snow so it doesn't snow in hawaii so it's not the snow people like to say and then i sent you the today show with arnie you know arnold schwarzenegger filling yeah. his pothole right so they did a whole show on why the potholes are happening and their data set is wrong. And I'm telling you, the potholes happen. Like, it didn't happen all over my property. It only happened at a certain spot because there was a condition where that big 18-wheeler would come in and it was downsloping. So you have to look at all the conditions. And then what you want to do is you want to do the dentist thing. You want to rip out the area deeper and wider. Now, if you're not able to pay for your existing potholes from five years ago, and I told you we need to rip the pothole deeper and wider, you're going to say like, no, 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 we can't, we can't do that. So just the fear of like the misunderstanding of the materials and what it is, and you keep using asphalt and using a weaker material like cold patching, you just don't do it right. And by not doing it right, you know, those people who make, have fillings, but have teeth, they're like, they grind their teeth at night. And if the filling is on the bottom, 
even with the right kind of like a better filling, it still breaks down. So because it's breaking down even teeth, right? Tooth material. So, so the, what's going to happen in the future? I'm just going to paint the picture to end this is that we could have mass migration issues, runs on cities and towns, because if the number of potholes, which is by the way, 55 million a year, new ones keep preparing, cool. right? In the U.S. In the U.S., just alone in the U.S. Other countries have this issue, right? You know, so we never upgraded the material called asphalt, and we're now going to put something that is so much stronger, so much better. That's why you buy them, right? And they weigh so much more onto the hands of, let's say, 100 million Americans start running around with this stuff, right? These electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are a great thing. It's just that if you're going to upgrade the car, you probably want to upgrade the road surface too. Yep. Upgrade the so infrastructure. The article, right. Yeah. So I, the article I sent you uh, from Discover Magazine, easily to look it up, you know, and, and it talks about, it's about to really come to a theater near you, is that this stuff that's, that's breaking down is going to double. So you're going to go from 55 million, maybe to 100 million potholes per year in the country by within the next 10 years. And they left out anything about electric vehicles. And then the Forbes article that talks about electric vehicle talked about it doubling, but also left out the whole thing about the um, climate conditions. So if you combine the two of them, well, it doesn't have to double and then double. It just shows you that we're playing whack-a-mole when we fix potholes. We're dealing with those those things. But the wrap-up of the story is I had no idea. This whole story that I gave you is real, 100% real. And I had no idea, I had no business doing this business, but because of the scientific mind and going through that, you kind of go through that exercise and you make it. And when you do make it, you get to tell the story. I assure us that we have all kinds of stories of people burning inside the forest that had great stories too, (laughs) but they never made it. So you never hear the story. So Mm -hmm. there is correlation for you. I stumbled on something really, really dramatic is that because we played whack-a-mole, because there's asphalt breaking down everywhere, and because we look at the sky to tell the weather, but nobody's pointing the cameras down on the roads and saying, don't look down. But, we, but do you know like this spot that's discolored? It, what's the percent chance of this turning into a pollen? Can we treat the surface area before it turns into a pollen? Can you do surface treatment? Imagine if you could do that with the reactive graphene. So that's why this company was formed, is to go and create an open platform for anybody who wants to ask those questions. With this fantastic. Material. Yeah. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. There you go. So that wraps it up. Any questions? <laughs> well, I do have one question at the end, but before sure. we go, I really enjoyed how you weaved all the stories together throughout our episode here and tied them all together at the end to let everyone know who's listening, how everything works and Oh, I want it to be to. interesting, right? I, yeah. I hope that you, you know, the listeners enjoy it. It's a little bit different. You know, the scientific mind works in, differently. You always exactly. tell if it's a scientist if they start talking like a politician, then <laughs> then that's a politician, right? Yeah, if they exactly. talk like a scientist, that's a scientist. If they talk like a lawyer, that's a lawyer. So if a cow sounds like a horse. It's really not a cow, right? Of course, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. I think we're make, be getting into animal farm here, but uh, yeah. Yeah. before we go down that path, I, yeah. I do have one question uh, that I ask everyone. Sure. I ask all my guests: Do you say data or data? I say both. Yeah, it really depends yeah. on my mood, kind of. Okay. Well, that's that's great. Well, I really appreciate your time, Gordon. I had a lovely time chatting with you, and I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Who's your daddy, right? Don't call me dad. I don't make kids do that. Thank you, Josh. (laughs) All right. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to You Say Data, I Say Data podcast. To become a member, sponsor, donor, or podcast guest, please visit us at analyticsimpactnetwork.org.